Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service. It's great to see you here. Um, slight change in order of service this morning. We're only going to sing two songs, so if you can stand now, and once you've stood up, I want you to say hello to somebody near you. That's your warming up exercise for the song, okay? <laughs> Are we all good? Right? We said hello. That's enough. You can stop now. That'll do. That'll do. All right. We're going to sing by faith. Let's sing. Stop talking. Stop having fun. 
Welcome to our church today, and uh, uh, it's great to be here, isn't it? It's lovely and warm inside the church, which we, which is really terrific, and uh, uh, we are praying for a warm time of fellowship as well. Um, friends, let's uh, join. Please join with me in prayer as we uh, commit ourselves to God. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much uh, for the great privilege that we have to come together as your people around your word. Uh, to pray, to sing, to encourage each other in the gospel of Jesus, and to encourage one another in our lives to be living with uh, Jesus as our Lord. Father, we pray uh, with gratitude that uh, you 
uh, provide us the strength to do so by your Holy Spirit. And we would pray, dear Lord, for your spirit that he would be working mightily amongst us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And a warm welcome to you if you're watching on the live stream as well. Uh, it's great to have you sharing with us uh, at this time and we trust that uh, your experience watching on the live stream will be a great blessing to you as well. Friends, uh, today we're uh, continuing our series on 2 Corinthians and uh, uh, we come to a really interesting chapter. Well, it's all interesting in 2 Corinthians, but I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, uh, this week we're uh, going to be looking at our earthly bodies and our heavenly hope uh, and Peter's going to be sharing with us on that. Next week I get to preach on the second half of 2 Corinthians 5, which is um, I, 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 it's a fabulous passage. You know, if we're crazy, if we're out of our minds for Christ, then so be it. I'm looking forward to that one. But we're going to read from uh, what, 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 10 now. And David is going to be our Bible reader this morning. Welcome, David. Good morning, everyone. We're reading from 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 10, and on this Bible, it's page 818. I've got to find it too now. <laughs> Wonderful. Now we know that if, our, if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we will have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is moral may be swallowed up by life. Mortal, sorry. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I look forward to hearing what uh, Peter has to say on that passage in a few moments' time. Um, later on in our service, we're going to be uh, reflecting um, more tangibly on the death of Christ on our behalf as we share together in the Lord's Supper. And uh, that will be a, a really helpful time to uh, think about uh, what Christ's death means for us and his resurrection and the future hope that we have because of what Christ has done on the cross. Now, there's a few things that are coming up in church life that I just wanted to uh, chat with you about, uh, particularly uh, next Saturday, uh, some good things happening next Saturday. Uh, the prayer meetings on Saturday morning in June have been really good so far and uh, I expect that will be continuing to be the case next Saturday as well. Uh, if you would um, like to come uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning um, here to the church, we go to a nice cosy part of the building and uh, uh, spend time uh, hearing about some things to be praying for, for our church, for our community, for our world, uh, then please come along. It's a great way of starting uh, the weekend. So that's next Saturday at 9 o'clock. Uh, following from that at 10 o'clock is the Women's Equip uh, Livestream Conference, which we're running here in the church. And I was excited to hear that there's a half a dozen or so ladies from the Warhope Presbyterian Church who are joining us, uh, uh, joining our ladies uh, next Saturday. And uh, so we're anticipating maybe about 30 plus people here for that. And uh, that's going to be a terrific time. If you've not registered for that as yet, I think you can still do so. 
And uh, the person to speak to is our drummer, um, Julia. She'd love to hear from you. Hey, the following Saturday, <coughs> you know, it never, never rains, it always pours, doesn't it? You know, there are three good things to be involved in on a Saturday the 24th, and you can read about those three good things in the bulletin. The one I, really, I do want to highlight is Nuts for Chaplaincy. And I guess that's the one that if we don't support it, it doesn't happen because it's our church um, family thing. Uh, and Nuts for Chaplaincy, it's a, it's a great idea. Ian and, uh, uh, Ian and Amanda Strauss, they're, um, uh, they're, they're accountants, um, but they also run a pecan farm. And it's a real farm as well. It's not just a tax dodge. It's a real farm. <laughs> There are real pecans there, or pecans as they say in the southern states of America, the pecan farm. And, uh, you know, they have this uh, big sort of uh, mechanical harvester that goes through and shakes the trees and picks all the nuts off it and all. And some nuts just drop to the ground. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, where, you, you know, some people could come, the poor people could come along after the harvest and pick up the stuff that's been left behind uh, called gleaning. Well, that's what we're able to do. And uh, it's, a, it's a great um, activity for families and for anyone to come along to, uh, to uh, get involved in. <clears throat> you know, they give you a bag of, a big nut bag, and you, you, you pick up the nuts, you fill your bag, and they then go and sell your bag of nuts, and all of the money goes to supporting uh, chaplaincy at Hastings Public School. Isn't that terrific? Isn't that great? I think reckon it'd be a really fun thing to do. I've not, I've not done it yet myself personally. Um, there's a free barbecue that's happening as well. And uh, anyway, so I know that we need to plan these things in advance. So you might want to think about that for um, two weekends time on that Saturday. Hey, um, uh, some of you have been asking about, uh, uh, you know, what happened to that Tolua fund that um, fundraising thing which we did back in Easter and some of you said how did that go Scott you remember that one we were raising money for um, electricity for the Tolua Bible uh, Theological Institute where they train Presbyterian uh, church leaders for the country of Vanuatu <laughs> they only have two hours of electricity at the moment and we know that Ian uh, Smith and uh, Jenny are over there at the moment doing some short-term uh, teaching and uh, Ian's getting a, a real experience coming from the college in Sydney to go into a college where he's got to be marking essays and setting exams and all of that sort of thing with only two hours of internet every day. So, uh, uh, hey, the results are pretty good. We were aiming for $70,000 um, across all the Presbyterian churches in Australia. <laughs> well, we got the $70,000, but you can put a one in front of that. Um, so one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, <laughs> and the Tolua people are they're pretty happy about that. <laughs> uh, what that means is that instead of getting the um, you know the <clears throat> Toyota Corolla version of a solar power system, <clears throat> they're going to get the um, <clears throat> I don't know the Lexus version. <laughs> something that's going to be really, really helpful for them and it's going to be long lasting into the future and they can afford some you know, better batteries, better panels. And if there's uh, money left over, it'll go into a, um, a fund for general maintenance for Tolua. So that's terrific guys. And uh, you contributed $4,300 of that $170,000. Uh, we just need to know what the outcome is. And it's a great outcome, isn't it? Hey, we're going to spend some time praying now, and I'm going to invite Alison to come to the front, and Alison is going to lead us in a time of prayer. Good morning, everyone. You may need to bear with me at times. Okay. Um, please join us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning on this long weekend. As we all get a bit of extra time off work or school or other duties, we pray that we would commit more time 
to looking at your word, to spending time in fellowship with our fellow Christians, and to generally assessing our lives to help us to live more for you. Father, we praise you for the Tolua Theological Institute in Vanuatu. We praise you for their hard work in sharing the good news to the people with Vanuatu and training up new leaders. Father, we praise you for the outpouring of funds to update their solar power stuff. Um, and we pray, Father, that that would be put to good use to continue to allow the gospel to go out in Vanuatu for many, many years to come. Father, we thank you for the work of the Alawa Children's Hospital. Father, we pray that they too need lots of funds to continue. Father, we pray again for you to move the hearts of your people to allow for generosity of funding to continue the good work that they do there. We pray for the children and families that are supported by the Alawa Children's Hospital. We pray that they would know you in amidst their suffering. We pray that you would bring them joy in their hard days. Lord, we pray that they would mostly know you um, so that they can be with you forever in heaven. Father, we thank you for the missionaries who work here in Port Macquarie. We thank you for Steve and Lauren Watt uh, working in AFES at the unis. Lord, we pray as semester break approaches and mid-year conference that that would be a time of good learning about you, Lord, while they break from their learning and their studies. We pray also for school scripture um, and particularly for Julia as she continues to preach the word of you to the school students around Port Macquarie. Father, we pray that you would raise up good funds there too, Lord. Father, we thank you for the chance that we have to come before you and learn from your word. We pray for the Equip Women's Conference coming up next weekend. We thank you that you have provided godly women to instruct the women of this church and of Australia. Lord, we pray that many would be able to attend, that they would be able to hear your word uh, and what's the word? And put it into their lives. <laughs> Mental blank. Um, Father, we also thank you for abundance coming up next month. And we pray, Lord, for Michelle as she prepares that um, it would be a good blessing to the women of this congregation. Father, we thank you for the tireless work of your servants day in, day out in this church. We pray for Scott and Pete and Benjamin um, that they would be able to continue to serve you, Lord. We pray for good rest for Cassie while she is away uh, and wonderful time reconnecting with her family. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Next song. Sorry, our next song is um, Amazing Grace. And it just um, reminds us um, of the joy that we have um, in the salvation we have through Christ. We all want to stand, and this is our um, offertory song. So the, um, <coughs> the um, people will come around, and <laughs> the Snellenbergs will come around and collect your offering if you've got anything. Just let them know. Here we go. Good 
to me is when my hope secures. He will my cheer and portion me as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun for better shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine, you are forever mine. Please stay standing, we're going to get the kids, we've got a few kids hiding. Coming on down the front, we'll grab some instruments. Thanks, Pete. We're going to sing Jesus number one, right at the top, where he belongs. So grab an instrument. And after this will be Kids Church. And at the end of church, you come back and join us with communion. How are we going? Getting close? Charlie's not taking one himself. No, he'll just sing along. Good eh? <laughs> All righty, let's sing Jesus number one.
expecting a big well drum done. solo at the end. <laughs> All right, kids, church, we'll see you a bit later on. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Bible reader today was David. He's my son. And uh, if you wanted to have a, a bit of a think about what I look like with hair in my youth, <laughs> it was a bit like David's at one stage. His, his is a bit longer, especially now. Speaking of age, um, Rex turns 80 tomorrow, so we've got to make sure we... Uh, we Give Rexy a, a bit of a birthday pat on the back. So, yeah. All right, let's um, pray and, and see if we can get some encouragement from this word today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time we share together now. Thank you for your word that uh, sheds light on, on the life that we have in this age and in the age to come. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be uh, encouraged as we think about these things today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your bulletin outline there, you'll see my introductory remark is there's no place like home. Can you remember a movie that that, uh, that, that quote comes from? There'd be a lot of people here who are younger who haven't seen The Wizard of Oz. But uh, in the movie The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is in the, the land of Oz and... Uh, She's ready to go home, and a fairy comes and tells her that she's got to tap her heels together three times in these glittery little shoes and say, repeating, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. There's, and then she says this, no, there's no place like home. Moments later, she wakes up back in Kansas after the tornadoes cut through, and she wakes from her unconsciousness back to be home with family and friends. And presumably she uh, you know, lives happily ever after and that type of thing. But I must say, um, I'm not actually much of a fan of The Wizard of Oz. I grew up in a family which didn't really appreciate musicals. My father used to call them musical stupid things and <laughs> walked out of the sound of music with when, he, when he was watching it with my mother. But, um, <laughs> but this, this particular line, you don't have to know much about The Wizard of Oz, but this particular line, there's no place like home is the salient point. And it just seems to ring true. It rings true for me and, and for so many people. And I wonder if you can relate to it too. There's no place like home. I mean, it's fun to go on holidays, isn't it? To travel and see some magnificent and wonderful things. And I'm not just talking about a day trip up to Kempsey to see the mighty Maclay River and the Slim Dusty Centre. <laughs> I mean, heading off to places like New Zealand to see the Alps, the glaciers, and to behold wonderful landscapes with, with family and friends. It's, it's terrific, isn't it, to go on a pretty special holiday. But for all the holidaying that people do, I've also heard them say, and I've said it myself, that was terrific. But gee, it's nice to get home too. And to be in my own bed. <laughs> Ah, there's no place like home. Well, in today's passage, Paul says something a little bit similar to that when he notes that he'd prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. For Paul, there was no place like home, and that was ultimately to be with the Lord. That was home for Paul. And it makes sense uh, that Paul speaks about that kind, of, that kind of longing or that kind of hope. But the context for those words uh, comes from chapter 4, verse 18, where he's just written that we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul, so to speak, is looking forward to that unseen and eternal future. And as he does so, he writes to the Corinthians to encourage them with that a glimpse of that future, and he writes to encourage us as well. 
about that hope of being at home with the Lord. There's no place like home. And the first point we note that he, he raises is that we look forward to new lives and a new home. That's the first point in the outline. He's, we're looking forward to new lives and a new home, new bodies actually. I'll read from verses 1 to 4. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. He, he raises the possibility, and, and, and it does happen, that the earthly tents will be destroyed. This is the prospect of dying and our bodies um, going to dust. And the prospect of dying actually uh, is, is something that uh, weighs heavily on Paul. It, it, in other letters, like in 1 Corinthians, it seems he's expecting the Lord to return in his lifetime. But in, in 2 Corinthians, he's thinking... No, he actually might die before that happens. In chapter 1, verse 18, he mentions hardship to the point of despairing of life. In verse 9 of chapter 1, he says, Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. And in chapter 4, he starts to recount some of his difficult experiences. In verse 8, he says, We're hard-pressed on every side. So Paul's well acquainted with hardship and the reality of death that comes through this letter, it, it seems that he, it hasn't been far away from him. But what's his reaction to the prospect of the body, the earthly tent, being destroyed? How does Paul cope with the prospect of his death? Well, it's not actually despair. On the contrary, there's hope in getting a renewed body. Verse 1 says, if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Likewise, in verse 2, he says, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. And again, in verse 4, for while we're in this tent, which is a, a, a metaphor for the body, we groan in a burden because we do not wish to be unclothed but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. This is the idea in other translations that not unclothed, but further clothed. Um, he talks about being without a body as a type of nakedness. And this is a, a consistent hope that he's got of the future. He's got a hope of a, of a, a, a new body. And he's, he's raised this hope uh, in 1 Corinthians. It's a consistent point that he's making here. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 to 44, he says, the body that is sown is perishable. He's talking about the earthly bodies we have now. And then he speaks about the resurrection body. He says, it is raised imperishable. It is sown a natural body and it's raised a spiritual body. And at this point, some uh, commentators draw attention to trains. And you're thinking, why do they draw attention to trains? Well, because trains are empowered by different things. In the past, they were empowered by steam. They were steam engines. But as things changed, they became empowered by diesel and electricity. And some point out that there's going to be bodies that we have uh, in God's new creation, his renewed creation, but our bodies won't be empowered in the same way they are now. They'll be empowered by God's spirit. If you think about Jesus' resurrected body, it was a, a special body where he, he had the marks of the nails and the spear in the side, but there was references to him being coming and going but not passing through walls and things like that. Uh, and so we, we're talking about our bodies are going to be like his resurrected body. It's a special body that we're going to be given. And Paul's talking about that kind of thing in this passage. So as Paul anticipates death, he writes not so much with despair, uh, but with hope for what God's going to do for his people. And in sum, he expects the mortal body is going to give away to a new body. In verse 4, he says, we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. There's an anticipation of a new kind of reality. 
Well, why is Paul so optimistic about this uh, new body in God's future kingdom? Well, we get the picture from some of the key words that crop up in verse 2 and verse 4. He says, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed. In verse 4, for while we're in this, this tent, we groan and are burdened. Paul describes life in this body as the experience of um, being characterised by groanings and longings and being burdened, and that, that experience uh, makes sense of his life too, doesn't it? When we think about uh, verses, chapter 4, verse 8 to 10, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, <coughs> perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Now, Paul's, Paul recounts, and we'll read this later in 2 Corinthians, he gives a, a list of his sufferings. We won't look at that passage today, but he's, he really goes through some difficult times. I mean, one of them is that he spends a, a, a night and the day in the open sea. Now, I can't even stand being in the sea for more than half an hour before I start to get cold. But anyways, he has some difficult, difficult struggles. And this language about groaning and longing and being burdened certain, certainly reflects aspects of life in a fallen world. Now, just to add a little bit of perspective here and balance, it's not the only thing that Paul says about life. Life is not only groaning and being burdened uh, and a difficult, difficult time in a fallen world. That is what life is like sometimes, and, and for some people it's, it's like that a lot of the time. It's, but this is just not the totality of all that Paul's saying. This sermon would be asymmetrical if I just said this is all of what Paul says about life. But for the purpose of this sermon, he is drawing attention to these struggles. And let me ask you, how many times have you ever felt burdened? or longed for a world restored. When we become familiar with some kind of disaster, experience of injustice, or we hear about violence, have you ever thought, oh, things shouldn't be like this? When we get a, and I, I, have, I thought of a list of things that I could share today, but, but by sharing those things, it just, you're left thinking about all these awful things that go on in the world. So I'm, I'm thinking you're acquainted with lots of things already. It's just suffice to say that there's violence out there. And when I hear about problems in Africa, I think that is dreadful, you know, it shouldn't be like this. When we get acquainted with bad news, we can kind of connect with what Paul's speaking about here, this language of groaning and longing for God's kingdom to come. Now, it's true that as we experience uh, different adversity, different hardships and struggles in life, we can be discouraged. God has made us as people with emotions and feelings, and when we face different kinds of problems, we don't have to pretend that we're altogether happy about everything that goes on in a fallen world. We don't have to pretend. I mean, we do rejoice in the Lord, but we don't have to pretend that, you know, when we we stub our toe kind of thing, that that's somehow great. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. And Paul knew that too. He accepts the burdens of this life and he spoke about groanings and longings and he's longing for what is mortal to be swallowed up by life. So he's, he's looking forward to a situation that's not a, a difficult experience in this fallen world. And when we face uh, sorrows as well in this life, and you'll be well acquainted with your sorrows, we're not left without hope. We have an orientation to the future. And uh, that's what this, this passage and other passages in the Bible help us as God's people to, to maintain our hope in a future in God's kingdom. And Paul wants to remind the Corinthians and us that God's going to restore our bodies in his kingdom to come. And each day that we live, we, we live with that hope, but we also have to live with the struggles uh, in a fallen world. But we don't live without hope because God's plans will succeed. God's going to actually do this. And we see that next in the next point, point two on my outline. God's plans will succeed in verse five. 
Now, it is God who made us for this very purpose. This is the restored bodies. And has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Life is not a random accident. God is taking history in a particular direction. He's bringing his kingdom to come. And uh, Paul looks forward to that, that uh, time. He knows that God's made us for that purpose, that longing that we have in our hearts for a, a better kind of future, one that's restored, is something that God has um, planned. He's made us for that purpose. To experience eternal life with him. And the spirit is given to us as a deposit guaranteeing that future. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration to keep you awake. Uh, when my mother was buying a half-decent second-hand car, I had the responsibility to help my mother. That's what sons are, one of their jobs, is to help their mother buy a car. And uh, as we worked with a salesman and came down on a car to get this particular vehicle that didn't have too many kilometres and wasn't clapped out, uh, the salesman uh, hopped into it and he was driving it off the site. He was driving it off the site so that we could take hold of the car and drive it away. And as he was driving the car off the lot, another salesman came along with some clients and he says, hey, where are you going with that? I've got people interested in buying it. And our salesman, with his cheeky look, said to him, it's too late. I've already got the deposit. <laughs> and uh, we'd handed down the deposit and secured the car. Now, it's important that when you go away from this sermon, you don't just remember this car illustration, okay? <laughs> God has done that kind of thing with us. He's handed down the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing our future with him. That's what the spirit's about. It's the, it's the point is something's given up front as a measure of the rest that'll come later. And it's the, uh, the resurrected bodies in God's uh, renewed um, creation that is the full thing that comes later. And we can trust God to deliver us into that, that kingdom. Paul notes that the one who's made us, God has made us with this purpose to be further clothed, to take down this earthly tent, put on our heavenly dwelling, and God gives us his spirit as we anticipate that future. This is the, the Christian hope. And Paul's emphasising this future orientation to life. He's, he's saying to the Corinthians, at one level we can't take this life too seriously, at one level. The super apostles were people who seemed to be big on triumph in this age. They were concerned to boast about themselves with their letters of recommendation. And they were less focused on the fact that this age, with its own frailties and weaknesses, is passing away. But Paul's orientation is clear that it's, it's God's kingdom to come that is the main game. And he wants his readers to be certain about God's faithfulness in delivering us into his kingdom, particularly in the face of our own deaths, when we can find all manner of discomfort and discouragements associated with death. There's a message from God's word today to remind us that uh, if we've received the Holy Spirit because we put our trust in Jesus, God will deliver us into his kingdom to come. And so God is going to do this. And that's the encouragement we can receive from this word. And so now we live by faith. That's point three in my outline. We'll pick it up in verses six to nine. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. And I'll read the next few verses in a moment. Paul's conscious that he's not yet home with the Lord. He accepts that in this age, we're in the body and we're away from the Lord. And in this stage of salvation, it's the time to live by faith. We live by trust, not by sight. When God's kingdom comes in all its fullness, as we read about in Revelation chapter 21, the renewal of the heavens and the earth takes place. And the kingdom of God comes that people have long been praying for, thy kingdom come. When it comes in its fullness, then we'll live by sight. 
when we dwell face to face with the Lord in this renewed earth. But until that time, we live by faith, trusting in the word of God as we anticipate that kingdom. Now, is Paul happy about this kind of situation, this you know, waiting around time? Does he find this current stage of life ideal? Well, no, well, let's look at it, verse 8. He says, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He's confident in what's coming, but he still prefers to be at home with the Lord. So it's, there's a kind of a, this age is a compromise. It's a mixed bag. We're grateful for small mercies, but we still prefer to be uh, in God's kingdom to come. And I think we can appreciate what Paul's saying too. When we experience uncomfortable situations, we think, oh, I wish life was a little less difficult, a bit simpler, a bit more peaceful. That's when we're sort of looking forward um, to God's kingdom to come. And in this age, Paul accepts not yet being with the Lord, but he makes it his goal to live to please the Lord in this age. In verse 9 he says, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home, in the body, or away from it. And so this is a point now for us to just think about what drives the Apostle Paul. It's interesting to note that pleasing the Lord is the principle that drives his life and his actions. He's not so hung up on being well-fed and comfortable. When we read the Sydney Morning Herald, there's lots of articles about food and holidays and you know, nice cheese to eat and wines to drink. Paul's not that hung up about you know, even good architecture. I really like you know, flat surfaces and not stairs and things like that. Paul's not, Paul's not hung up about being comfortable. Um, his prime focus isn't stamp collecting or watching the soccer. His main objective in life is pleasing the Lord. That's just interesting. This is what drives him. And it explains a lot about what he does, doesn't it? He, he wants to please the Lord, and so he gives up different comforts and takes the good news out. And, um... Okay, so as we think about uh, our lives as well and what principles drive us, the challenge is to think about where God has placed us as his people at this st stage of life. God's put us amongst family and friends, neighbours, clubs, community groups and workplaces. And the question, an application question really is, what does it mean for us to please the Lord in the places that God's put us? I sometimes get curious about how a Christian might do their job different to somebody who's got a different worldview or is an unbeliever. And so is there a distinctively Christian way to be a cleaner? Some of the kids go and work at one of the places in town and do some cleaning. Is there is a way that they do their Christian cleaning. You know, they actually sweep the, the dust and rubbish up into the dustpan and put it in the bin. They don't sweep it under the carpet. That would be a distinctively Christian way to clean, wouldn't it? Is there a way to be a, a Christian town planner? They won't be taking any bribes. Presumably they'll be trying to do what's, what's honest and work with the laws. Is there a way to be a Christian painter? Well, presumably the Christian painter is going to make sure they mix in new paint for the client. They don't take the old mouldy stuff and pop it in and sort of water it down. Pleasing the Lord is going to overflow into all sorts of areas of our lives, isn't it? Uh, whether it's in our work. I was thinking about the next door, there's a, a dog washer, one of those mobile dog washers. They'll probably put enough shampoo in the dog wash. There we go. If they're a Christian, <laughs> they'll do that. So being a Christian, what, whatever we do, we, we seek to please the Lord, and that's going to affect the way that we carry ourselves in our families, clubs, neighbourhoods, and in our work. And it's a good question to wrestle with. What might it look like to please the Lord in our areas of responsibility? Paul would prefer to be at home with the Lord, but he lived by faith, making it his aim to please the Lord. And may God help us to be amongst those who are also having it as our prime focus, as we live, live to please the Lord. Paul also seeks to please the Lord in view of what comes next in this section, and that is the judgment day. 
all will face the judgment day. We see that clearly in verse 10, don't we? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In Acts chapter 18, we learn that when Paul was in Corinth, he was brought into the local court that was in the middle of town, and he stood before the judge Gallio, a Roman governor of the day, who would sit on the judgment seat in the middle of town in public view, and from there he would make his judgments. And so these Corinthians, they were familiar with the judgment seat. Well, that was the judgment seat of a Roman governor, but here Paul's talking about the judgment seat of the Messiah, Christ, Jesus. And Paul was taken to the court by the Jews who rejected his teaching about Jesus. That's why he was taken to the court. But Gallio didn't really uh, want to know about their case. And uh, he threw it out and had them ejected from the court. Now, as Paul writes to the Corinthians that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, I wonder if he also had in mind that the, the Corinthians needed to know it's not just an earthly judge who matters, it's the Lord. He's the heavenly judge. He's the one who matters as we live to please the Lord. That's, that's who we're, we're also to be mindful of. And knowing about that judgment day impacts Paul's thinking. In verse 9, he's just said, we make it our aim to please the Lord, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So he's, he's conscious that as he lives to please the Lord, um, that's, that's par partly what's in his mind. In fact, in the next verse too, he says, in verse 11, since, and this is outside the scope of our passage, so Scott will pick this more up next week, but he says, uh, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. Knowing about God's judgment day uh, drives Paul to persuade other men to get right with the judge. Paul fears the Lord. He seeks, seeks to bring the good news of Jesus who rescues us from God's righteous judgment to come. In fact, in verse 19, he points out that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. And because all will face the judgment day, which is a, an uncomfortable prospect to say the least, the good news is true that we're also reconciled to God through Jesus and he doesn't count our sin against us. Isn't that comforting? One commentator pointed out, this was Paul Barnett, he wrote that Paul's less concerned about God's condemnation because we know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus from Romans chapter, one, uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 1. But he's more concerned about God's evaluation. He's not worried about being condemned because he's in Christ, but he's still conscious of God's evaluation. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, he talks about people who serve, and if they do a, a you know, pretty average job, but they get saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. He's kind of cons conscious that God's still going to be judging and evaluating. But as we think about the um, judgment day to come, come rather, uh, it reminds us to be grateful to God for a saviour, doesn't it? As we think about our lives and the ways that we, we fall short all the time, uh, God knows that and it reminds us why he sent Jesus. He's given us a saviour so that we enjoy reconciliation of God, not having our sins counted against us. That's, that's the, um, the good news. Well, in conclusion, let us keep this life in perspective. When we find ourselves burdened and groaning about hardships, and when we're longing for a, a different kind of future of a restored uh, world, we find ourselves longing to be at home with the Lord. And that's, that's a good place to, for us to remain, to remain with our hope. Uh, longing to be at home with the Lord. Not, not so um, comfortable in this age that we're not longing for God's kingdom to come. Uh, the things that we've been looking at today have been given for our encouragement so that we, we find comfort in God. Uh, and as we think about what that reality might look like, it's, it's a bit mysterious, uh, hard for us to conceptualise. But I'm going to give you a quote as I close this sermon from... Uh, one of my former teachers, Dr. 
uh, John Arthur Davies, who wrote, heaven ain't going there, a down-to-earth look at eternal life, because he's raising that it's not just about going to some uh, platonic floating around with clouds in the sky kind of thing. God talks about renewing and restoring this good creation and giving us new bodies. It's, um, that's something that he's emphasising. But in this, um, he says about the, the, the points Paul's raising, a new body that we'll be receiving. He says, such glimpses as we have of a world to come are given to encourage us to persevere in the face of our present struggles and difficulties, to reinforce our hope in God as a God of love and grace, a God who can be relied upon to keep his promises, indeed to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. We're given uh, some teaching about the life to come so that we're actually uh, encouraged to persevere uh, and enter that kingdom. And so may God help us to be among those people who do persevere as we anticipate that future, that glorious future of being at home with the Lord. Now let us close in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Lord God, we give you thanks for uh, your kindness uh, in giving us hope in Jesus for a future where we'll be at home with you. Lord, we thank you that you've even um, revealed some things in your word to us about that time, about uh, bodies that will be restored and renewed to be like our Lord's body. And Lord, uh, we pray that you'd help us to be having our eyes fixed on um, looking forward to your kingdom to come. We pray that your kingdom would come and we pray that you'd help us to persevere uh, and enter into it. Lord, we thank you that we can encourage each other today as we um, read about uh, these, these good things in your word that remind us about your, your care for us and your willingness to uh, be reconciled to us and us reconciled to you and, and not have our sins counted against us. And Lord, we thank you that uh, we stand in your grace as your people. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again, so if you want to stand, we're going to sing Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Oh,
It's been great, hasn't it, looking at that passage and uh, being reminded that in the, uh, all of the struggles and the difficulties and the challenges of, of this life, that um, this home expressed in our, in our bodies is, is only temporary and that uh, we can be strengthened and encouraged to continue to serve the Lord because we, knew, we know of the future that we have a renewed body, a renewed life uh, in his heavenly kingdom. And that, of course, uh, is only made possible by the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, so it's important for us to, uh, to think about Christ's death for our sins and about his resurrection that uh, guarantees the, the new life that we can have because of him. And so um, I'm reminded of a, a passage from 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, which speaks about Jesus. And listen carefully to what Peter says about Christ. Uh, Peter says, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Well, it's important for us to uh, confess our sins to, to God. Uh, please pray with me in the quietness of your own hearts as I lead us in a prayer of confession. Father, today we acknowledge that we were once slaves to sin and destined for your eternal judgment. We are sinful. and We know that we do not deserve so much as to gather up the crumbs from under your table. And so it is with heartfelt gratitude and joy that we give you thanks that Jesus willingly suffered, that he suffered for us, that he suffered by going to the cross where he was cut off from you and bore our guilt upon himself. Father, we thank you that his death was not the end, that uh, you raised your son Jesus to life again because his sacrifice has been sufficient to pay for all of our guilt, all of our sin, so that we can be forgiven, that we can have that fresh start with you, a new life, a new life that goes on forever into an internal body. And we thank and praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he shared the Passover with his disciples. And by doing so, he reminded them, as he reminds us, that God is a saving God. That God is the God who had rescued Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. But from now on, that uh, celebration, that meal, would not be to remember that salvation of old, but rather to remember what Christ himself was about to do as the sacrificial lamb 
uh, who would be who would mean that by his blood that we can be released from our slavery to sin and into God's eternal kingdom. In Luke chapter 22, uh, during that Passover meal, Luke tells us that when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. And taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Uh, Jesus knew that he would soon suffer and leave them, but that there would be another banquet where he would eat and drink a resurrection banquet in the kingdom of God. And Luke continues by saying, And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're going to distribute the uh, bread and the wine. Uh, the bread is gluten-free and uh, the wine is non-alcoholic. And so uh, when you receive the bread and the wine, please uh, retain it so that we can eat and drink together.
Eat this bread in remembrance of Christ's body that was broken for you and be thankful. In the same way, says Luke, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of Christ's blood that was shed for you, and be thankful. Please join with me in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for Jesus and as we have remembered his death by both word and in the supper, we pray that we would grasp more of just how wide and long and deep is your love for us in Christ Jesus, that we may trust, love and serve him all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our um, last song um, today, if we want to stand together, um, all glory be to Christ. Are we praise Him and thank Him to the to the tune of Old Lang Syne. Yes. <laughs>
today that uh, we know that this earthly tent, <laughs> this body in which we live is, well it's actually like a tent isn't it? It's something which is temporary, it's not, not a permanent home and uh, that through the struggles and the difficulties of this life we know that we have a, uh, a heavenly tent which is not built by men but um, is our eternal home. Uh, I'm looking forward to that aren't you? And uh, it's such an encouragement and also a challenge for us to not cling so tightly to the temporary things of this life, but rather to invest our lives in serving the Lord and doing things which last for all of eternity. Um, folks, uh, we're going to have some, some morning tea now, and so I'd encourage you to stick around and keep on encouraging one another in these things. And morning tea will be served out in the courtyard. I look forward to uh, talking with you out there.